Proverbs chapter number 17. I'm going to read one verse. Doesn't mean that the lesson is going to be short. But Proverbs chapter number 17, verse number 3. The Bible says, The finding pot is for silver, and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. Now, in your Bible, silver and gold, oft referred to, and we know that they are precious, but they both represent two very different things when it comes to the types in the Bible. Silver, we know that God referred to His Word as silver. He said when it shall be tried seven times, that it should be perfect, that that would be the final perfect Word of the the Lord. Well, if you study out your Bible and you study history, what was the seventh major translation of the Bible? That would be the KJV 1611. That's why we believe that the KJV 1611 for English-speaking people is the Word of God. Unadulterated, not to be messed with, and we all know that because there's a sign on the wall. Right? If you had a problem with that, you wouldn't be here this morning. Okay? But, the example that I wanted to draw was that God referred to His Word as silver being tried seven times. Now silver, just like the Word of God, okay, in that illustration, silver is a representation of pure silver being something that is perfect. Now perfect, not meaning, you know, sinless. Okay, we'll get to that here in a little bit. But perfect meaning without flaw, without error, complete. Okay, silver in your Bible is a picture of something that in God's eyes is lacking nothing and has nothing else added to it. It is perfect. It doesn't need to be changed. Pure silver is something that is perfect in God's eyes. Okay, now we got gold. Okay, gold, always a sign of righteousness. What did Job say? He said, when he try me, I shall come forth as what? Gold. Those around Job, I mean his own wife, granted, nobody in this room, right? And I dare say very few people that have ever lived have had a day like Job, and half of those would have been, you know, even half as much would have had a day like Job's wife. She just watched everything that her husband had ever labored for, right? Everything that God had blessed him with, it was gone in a single day. And she saw the toll that it took on Job and her and her brokenheartedness. I believe she said it out of pity, not out of reprimand, not out of being bitter. But she looked at Job and she saw everything that he was under and she said, Job, curse God and die. She said, it kills me to see you the way that you are right now. Then his so-called friends show up, all of them telling him that he's done something against God, that his secret sin has finally been made known to everybody else. And Job finally, after he, you know, reasons with them for a couple of chapters, eventually he tells them, I'll shut up. Right? I know what God put in me. I know what I've been faithful to keep. And when all of this is over, I'm going to come forth as gold. In other words, what he's saying is, before God blessed me, God saw me as righteous in his eyes. After God blessed me, I stayed righteous. And until the end, I will be righteous, not for my sake, but for his sake. In other words, gold, okay, righteousness. So, here in chapter number 17, verse number 3 of the book of Proverbs, it says, the finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. Now that is referring to the refinement or the purification process of both of those metals now we know that they're both metals they both come from the ground God put them there when he made everything but because of the way that God made everything you can't just go and get 24 karat gold out the ground you can't just go and get fine .99999 silver out of the ground okay in fact if you can get it nowadays, because of some laws that were passed in the 70s, and don't get me started on politics today, but that took us off of the gold standard. Okay. Then there were some more laws passed that said you can't privately own any bullion, which means I can't go out and just buy a 24-karat gold bar if I want to. 
which makes me angry. But nowadays, if you do get pure gold or pure silver, most of the time, it's in minted coins. Right? And it's backed by a federal government or it's backed by some banking institution that says, one, we promise that this, what it says on it is the actual purity of it, and two, right, we certify that everything in it is what it, we say it is. If it says it's a quarter of an ounce of gold, it's a quarter of an ounce of gold. If they say it's an ounce, it's an ounce. Right? Well, it don't come out the ground like that where they just smack it with a hammer and turn it into a coin. Yeah, you have to refine it because gold in silver is often taken out of the ground as gold ore and silver ore. Now, what does ore mean? It means that it's silver metal mixed with other stuff. Okay, we've heard of iron ore. You can't just take iron ore, chuck it into a furnace, and then get steel out of it the next day. Right? You have to separate the things that you don't want from the thing that you do want. And in Bible times and even to this day, the refining process for silver and gold is still very similar. Okay, it says that silver uses the fining pot. Well, a fining pot was something, depending on how big of a metal worker you were, it could be something this big, it could be something you know as big as this stage if you really wanted it to be nowadays. But you would put silver ore into this pot. And the pot was made to be heated up very, very hot without breaking, without shattering, without the pot giving away. Okay, most of the time they refer to it as a crucible. Okay. Now, the silver, as it heat up, it starts to liquefy. Okay, that's what all metal does. If you get any metal hot enough, it's going to start turning into a liquid. Okay, now when silver liquefies, all those things that are also metal in the finding pot and all those things which are not metal are going to separate from the silver. And the finding pot was used because you didn't need to get down into the bottom of the silver. The silver was heavier than anything that it was going to be attached to. So all those impurities that couldn't be dissolved, they would float to the top. And all the other metals that may be a part of it would rise above the silver. And so they would call that the dross, D-R-O-S-S. -S. And they would take a ladle and they would skim the top of it, take those impurities, and then throw them off to the side. They say that in order to get pure silver back in Bible days, you'd have to do that process seven times, which is why the illustration that the Lord gave about His Word, right, being refined, the seventh time was the perfect one, one without fault, one without error. Okay, the way that God intended it to be preserved. Okay, well, they say that the test on whether or not what you've got is pure silver is while it's still liquefied, the silversmith would look into that finding pot and he'd be able to see his own reflection. That meant that the only thing left in it was silver. If it was cloudy, it had a different metal in there. Because silver... It's supposed to be shiny. Right? If there were beads in it or dots in it, that meant that there was still something that needed to be skimmed off the top. Something that wasn't silver was still in there. But it would be just like a mirror. He'd be able to see his own reflection. Clear as day. Just like a mirror. Okay, so that's how they would refine silver. Now let's look at how they refine gold. Silver has a much lower melting point than gold does right? that's why you can put it in a crucible and heat it you know but anybody remember chemistry class with Bunsen burners right you could do that and if you had a hot enough Bunsen burner you can melt silver at your desk okay can't do that with gold you got to get a lot hotter well gold they would put in a furnace okay throughout time there were things called bloomery furnaces there were things called blast furnaces Nowadays, they got big old industrial furnaces. Okay, but the point was you had to get it hot enough to melt gold. Now, gold's a very heavy substance. 
that it's likened unto lead and the fact that a little tiny amount of it weighs a whole lot. So when you would heat up gold, just like silver, anything that's not gold, it don't weigh as much as the gold does. It's not as dense. Okay, all those rocks, those get separated out. Okay, but gold's very soft as well. We know that back in old western times and in cowboy movies if they didn't think that your gold was real they'd bite down on it and if they left a tooth mark that meant it was real gold because real gold is soft it's malleable in fact gold's one of the very few substances that you can what they do cold weld that means if you take two pieces of gold no matter how thick or how thin and you press them together hard enough without any heat it'll stick together it'll become one piece Right? That's how soft gold is. So knowing that gold is that soft, they would put it in that furnace and all the things that weren't gold would separate. The gold would come down to the bottom and then they could let it cool down. And you would see as if it were layers in it. And things that aren't golden come off real easy from things that are gold. Once you've heated it up very hot, it'll separate out then you could just take the stuff that's not gold and knock it off of it if you got any doubts you could throw it back in repeat the process but see silver the impurities have to be monitored if you let silver cool down with those impurities in, it's going to stick inside of it and the only way to separate it is to keep it hot and then take the things out of it while it's hot Gold, on the other hand, you can get it hot, let it cool down, take those things off that separate out, and then you just got to get it hot again. There's a cycle to it, if you will. And now, Brother Jordan, why in the world are you talking about all of this jewelry working? Uh, hang with me. Okay, we know that nowadays people don't wear around on jewelry, wedding rings, necklaces. You don't wear 24 karat gold. It's too soft. <coughs> In fact, it's so soft that if you was trying to put a shirt on one day and had a necklace on and caught your thumb through it, you'd snap it if you yanked hard enough. Right? If you had a wedding ring that, God forbid, you sit on the sink and it ended up down in the garbage disposal, okay? If it was 24 karat gold and the garbage disposal was on, that thing's liable to come out in pieces instead of a ring. That's how soft it is. It's that malleable. It's fragile. So nowadays, they mix things into it. That's why when you go and they say, ah, oh, this is a 14 karat gold. Well, that's not pure gold. Yeah, but pure gold's soft. This, we put other stuff in it. There's white gold, that's silver and gold mixed together. There's rose gold. There's all these different kinds of gold nowadays. But the whole point is to make it stronger. Okay, well. Let's go back to verse number, or chapter number 17, verse number 3. The finding pot for silver and the furnace for gold. But the Lord tries the hearts. Now in this verse, Solomon's making a comparison to the heart of man and silver and gold. We know that the heart is the seat of emotion in man. The Bible teaches that all the emotions that you feel, all the struggle and all the strife that you experience in life, that happens within your heart. Right? Man looketh on the outward appearance, God looketh on the heart. We may be able to put on an air that everything's okay, that we're not going through the ringer, but your heart tells the true story. But your heart also is valuable unto God. When it says that God trieth the heart, what you do when you put silver into a finding pot is you're trying it. The process is to try it in order to find out how much silver's there. And through the trying process, you remove everything else that isn't silver. The purpose of the furnace for gold is to try it. You know there's gold in there, but you want to find out how much gold. And you want to get it down to where only gold is left. You're trying the material 
to figure out what's gold and what's not gold, or what's silver and what's not silver. So when it says that God tries the heart, what it's saying is when God looks at you, God wants to find out how much in there is what he put in there and how much he didn't put in there. Now, you know why people go through all that effort to get pure gold and to get pure silver? Because it's valuable to them. They don't want half silver. They want whole silver. They want the best. Right? That's the whole custom behind giving a wedding ring made out of something precious. Right? I love you more than anybody else. So I'm going to give you something that is precious, that's real. It's not a knockoff. Right? It has value to symbolize, you know, this isn't just how much, I, but this is a token of how much I really do love you. And it's a symbol of my, well, what was intended to be, right, lifelong commitment unto you. Right? As precious as this metal is, right, that's how precious I consider the vows that we took today. Right? That's the whole purpose. That wouldn't mean too much if they made it out of an aluminum Coke can. Right? That wouldn't mean too much if they went out there and, well, some people would probably be into some, Brother Eric's crowd would probably be okay with like, I, I carved this ring out of wood and it took me nine years. Right? I could see Brother Bob doing something like that. I could see that. But, right, the whole purpose is that it's something valuable. Why did God save man? Because he saw value in you. He loved you. We think and we consider ourselves that we were in a state once where we were unlovable. Not according to your Bible. It says that God loved you with an everlasting love. It told Job that he knew him before he formed him in the belly. God always knew what you were going to be, but he still loved you anyway. That's why John 3, 16 so sweet. God so loved the world, that means even though he knew what you were, he loved you anyway. Long before he knew what you would become, which was sin cursed, sin born, sinner by practice, and sinner by trade, he still chose to make you because he loved you. Even knowing that you would be born into something called sin, which was a result of man's disobedience unto God. But he loved you enough to make you anyway. Loved you enough to make a way that you could be redeemed. And then after he redeemed you, he determined, which was his prerogative, because our life's no longer our own, we're bought with a price. God determined that all those that got saved, this is the only thing that you're going to find in your Bible, that it says God predestinated. So I guess we're making a Calvinist today angry too, Brother Ron. But it was predestined that those that got saved would be conformed to the image of His Son. That's the only thing that God predestined. Other than Christ being the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, and those that would believe on Him would be conformed into the image of His Son. Well, if you go, let's say we're back in the 49ers. Okay, we're out in California. There's been a big gold rush. We're out there, we're sifting for gold and water. Right? We got sluices set up. We got people blowing up dynamite down in a cave somewhere trying to get gold ore out of the ground. You go through all that effort to finally get it into your hand, and you've got gold plus other stuff. Well, see, I could take this down to the jeweler, and he's, he's going to think, well, there's something in there that's valuable, but I don't know how valuable. Right? Yeah, that's gold, but that's other stuff too. We don't want the other stuff. Come back when it's just gold. Right, fellas? If you went out and you bought your significant other a gold ring, but it was caked in a whole bunch of other stuff and you couldn't see the gold on the inside, right? the lady would show up and say, oh, hey, I got engaged, and they'd say, what in the world is that made out of? People are used to seeing gold. Right? If it's got oil and tar and everything else caked on the outside of it, right? well, what happened to it? Well, he carried it in his pocket every day down at the car shop. But there's real gold in it. How do you know? 
Well, because he told me. Right? Take that down to a jeweler, and he'd say, hey, but that thing's got to get cleaned up before I'll even make you an offer. I can't do anything with that in the state that it's currently in. Right now, imagine that you are that ring, are that precious thing that God wants to put on display as a token of what the love of Christ did in your life. And if the world sees all that tar and all that gunk, and they see all the mud that they deal with every day, why in the world would they want to receive what Jesus gave them? Because He gave it. It's just up to us to receive it. It's right there, ready to be taken, to be accepted. But what's the token of what God has done for man through Christ? Other believers. You can have a hunk of metal and know that there's some gold in there. But until you find out how much gold, until you take all those tiny pieces of gold and blast them hot enough to where they become one piece of gold, until you fashion it into a ring, people don't want it. You could say, well, there's gold in here. Yeah, but that's a gamble. I don't know. God's not in the business of people trying to figure things out on their own. God does things plain. In fact, He says, beware of those things done in secret. Because everything that God does is out in the open for everyone to see. It is evident. Right? I mean, our forefathers wrote, we hold these, these things to be self-evident that all men were created equal. What does, that, what does that word evident mean? Plain to see. We hold these truths to be self-evident. You don't need to argue about it. You don't need to go out and look for some secret wisdom. God made all men in His image, which according to God means all men were created equal in the image of God. That's self-evident. Well, what should our life be? It should be self-evident of the fact that God put something precious into us and when he did so, he removed all the things that weren't precious. And as a result, we can be self-evident in the fact that what God put in us is truly valuable. You ain't got to guess about it. You don't have to bite down on it and see if it's soft enough to be real gold. You don't have to heat it up and then melt it back down again. You can tell it's pure silver. Right, man? All that being said... The process of how God does that is alluded to in this verse, but we find a whole lot more instances throughout Scripture of what the process of God trying the hearts of man really is. It's like gold and it's like silver being refined. But see, verse number 3 says, the fining pot for silver, everybody knew the fining pot had to get hot. It says the furnace for gold. Everybody knew that the furnace that they used to refine gold, that thing got hot. And it says, but the Lord tries the hearts. Do you guys remember? I know I quote this verse a lot. Over in Deuteronomy, you can go over to Peter's epistles. You're going to find that our God is a consuming fire. Right? We like the verse that God is love. But just as much that God is love, God is a consuming fire. It's just a part of who He is. Now, I firmly believe that God is not a fire, but that's just what He had to write down for us to get through our thick heads what the presence of God is really like. Now, this may be a little bit of theology according to Jordan, but you know why I believe that God told Moses that no man could see His face and live? Because the vision, the visage of God, looking full face into the beauty and the wonder and the holiness of the Creator is a consuming fire. He didn't say that no man can see my face. He said no man can see me and live. Any glimpse of Him is a consuming fire. But He said you can see my glory. That's something that follows after. That's a result of God being nearby. God's glory is not a part of God, which is why Moses could see it. That's why we 
can every now and then have a service where the glory of God falls down and we get to live in it for a little while. We just get to be more than seers. We get to be partakers. Right? But why can no man see God? Because the very visage of God is a trying fire. The Bible says that I must decrease so that He can increase. There's that balance. Right? Remember what we said. What's the point of the finding pot in the furnace? To increase the percentage of gold or silver and decrease the percentage of everything else. All you want left is what's precious. But what am I? I am not precious. In fact, one of the great mysteries that the Apostle Paul wrote about, right? we still can't wrap our head around it, but we know that God decided to do it, was that God would put His treasure in earthen vessels. Why would God put His salvation, put the robe of righteousness of His Son on this dirty old vessel of dirt? But yet He chose to do it. The mystery is in the fact that God can take an earthen vessel and turn it into a vessel of honor. The mystery of how He put into me what's a part of Him, I can't figure that out. That was the Holy Ghost job when I got saved. I don't know how He did it. And I don't know how he takes something that was altogether worthless and turn it into something of value for him. But that's not my job. My job is to be the vessel of honor. The Apostle Paul wrote that it was his will and it was God's will that every one of us would know how to possess our vessel and use it under the honor and glory of God. You know what that means? Be what God makes you. And whatever God makes you into... Use those abilities, use those opportunities, use those natural things that God made you with and the fruits of the Spirit that He added to you as the new creature and use your vessel for God's glory. But see, God tries the hearts. Who would do, I mean, do we really need to? I already quoted the other verse. Samuel's looking at the sons of Jesse and he's saying well surely that one's a king God says nope 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 he looks at Jesse he says you sure you don't have any other sons around here he says ah we got that red headed one down there watching the sheep he's kind of wild a little weird he's out there singing songs all the time we try to teach him how to use the sword he wants to use a slingshot uh, but he's out there watching the sheep and he's like go, go fetch him and he shows up and Samuel says, Lord, surely, well, what was the reprimand of the man? Keep in mind, Samuel was God's man. And God even rebuked him. Said, man looketh on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Who else would try the hearts of man except the one that can see it? God tries the hearts because God sees the hearts. Well, see, the thing about your heart is, and the thing that, about how God made us, we like attachments. Right? If we care about something, we want to make it a part of us. Right? Really, you can boil anything down in the world today to that statement. Why do people go crazy over UK? Because they've made it a part of them. It has nothing to do with them. They're not going to touch the field. Right? They're not going to be one of the coaches. They graduated a long time ago, if they graduated at all. They got no affiliation with the school anymore. If they showed up, they'd say, who are you? But yet, if Big Blue wins, that makes their whole week. Why? Because they made it a part of them. Right? Why do you think that the Bible talks about not being unequally yoked together? Certainly that's true in marriage. But he wasn't just talking about marriage. He said, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That means in life. Right? Don't entangle yourself with things that are not of God. To be yoked together means you can't get away from it. You've not just made it a part of you. You've committed to it. You've said, I'm not going to leave this. Knowing that what you yoked yourself up to may not have been a God. 
Why do you think that's such a dangerous thing to do? Because you've made it a part of you. God and mammon cannot dwell, cannot have fellowship. In order for you to attach something to you that is not of God, you have to kick part of God out of your life. The very decision of staying in between, well, should I or shouldn't I? The Apostle Paul wrote, how long halts you between two opinions? Right? How long are you going to sit there and debate it? Either God's right or you're right. And if you were right, you wouldn't be debating it. You would know. Right? Well, how long are we going to waffle between does this need to be a part of my life or does this not need to be a part of my life? The problem is, is we're trying to try ourselves. We're trying to refine ourselves. We think, well, 14 karat gold's a whole lot better than 10 karat gold. Not in the eyes of God. You know why they put it into the furnace? Because they wanted pure gold. You know anything that isn't pure gold is gold plus something else. Well, if you're wanting gold, you don't want gold plus something else. You want gold. But you know why they refer to mercury as quicksilver? Because it would look like silver, but, but it never hardens. So it, at normal temperatures, it's a liquid. And it'd shoot around. That's why they call it quicksilver. Well, if you get silver hot to where it's a liquid, and you put it next to mercury, quicksilver, and you were to roll them down a the board, mercury, you could tell that that's not silver because it moves quicker. Right? It will slide down the board a whole lot faster than real silver. Right? If offered the two, which one you want? You want that one that moved real quick? Because that was a pretty cool party trick. Oh, by the way, mercury, it'll kill you. It's a toxin. Well, it looks the same. It behaves a little bit different. It's not the same thing. Y'all know that? Well, it was a book, and they made a bunch of dumb movies about it. Alice in Wonderland. You know why the Mad Hatter was mad? Because he worked with mercury to make hats. And he absorbed so much of it through his fingertips that it made him a little crazy. That was a stereotype back in the day. People that worked with mercury, they knew that's bad for you. You end up acting like that guy. Right? You will lose your mind working with mercury, but yet people still want it. They don't want silver. Why? Because you can get mercury without going through the fire. You can get mercury without going through the heat. Let's say, I've got a bottle of silver. Well, is it silver? Because it don't move like silver. Silver, if it's in a jar, it's hard. It don't move around like a liquid. God tries the hearts because man's satisfi satisfied with a lot of things that aren't pure. You know what passes through the judgment of God or the fire of God? Only those things that are pure. Aren't we admonished? to lay up our treasures in heaven, gold, silver, and precious gems, not wood, hay, and stubble here on the earth. Why is that? Wood, hay, and stubble don't make it through the fire. You can take a diamond and throw it in a furnace. Guess what it's coming out as? Diamond. You can throw gold into a furnace. Guess what it's coming out? Gold. You can throw silver into a finding pot, and guess what's coming out? Silver. Doesn't matter what heat you use, how hot it gets. Doesn't matter how long you leave it in there. When it passes through the fire, guess what's coming out the other side? What went in. You can't make it disappear. You know what happens to other things that are a part of that ore, silver ore and gold ore? You know what happens when you throw them into the fire? They don't last. They separate. They get cast aside. Get that out of here. That's not silver. Because silver don't look like that. Silver don't act like that. Gold doesn't behave that way. Get it out of here. 
Well, why does God try the hearts of men? Because if man tried the hearts of man, man would be satisfied with a whole lot of things that aren't gold and aren't silver. Keep in mind, what was silver? A picture of perfection. Without football. Without missing anything and not having to have anything added to it. It's exactly what it needs to be. What was gold a picture of? Righteousness. Right? All of my righteousness is as filthy rags. Why would God want me to try my righteousness? Even on my most righteous day, all I've got to offer is dirty rags. Fit to be burned. Right? If I, in my own, were allowed to, or were able to find my own silver, to take that which was impure and make it into something that God found acceptable in His sight, why did Christ have to die on the cross? Why did Christ have to pay for my sin debt if I was able to be pure silver in the eyes of God? Wanting nothing, needing nothing. Don't have to have anything taken away from it. Exactly what God finds acceptable. God tries the hearts because God is unbiased. You know what God's standard is? Holy. You know what, really? I believe that the fire of God, because our God is a consuming fire. You know what I really believe that fire of God is? That's just the manifestation of His holiness. You know what can hang around when holiness is there? Holiness. Anything that's not holiness, it get gone. You know when it says that God poured out His judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah and Nineveh in the Bible? You know what I believe He did? He revealed a little bit of His holiness and everything that wasn't holiness was consumed. Because in order to approach a holy God, what do you have to be? Holy. Read your Bible. It says that the cherubims guard the throne of God. You know what their job is? Their job is to look for holy. You know what's allowed to get past them? Holy. Anything that's not holy, it's not allowed to get past them. You know why them seraphim that fly around the throne of God with two wings and cover their face with two wings and cover their feet with two wings? You know why their face and their feet are covered? Because they know that they're not holy. And they want to keep anything that's not holy from detracting from the visage of what they're singing about. Holy, holy, holy. They're making sure that the part of them that isn't holy doesn't distract from what is holy. You know why God tries the hearts of man? Because God knows what holy is. But see, here's the thing. I've said this the past couple of weeks. Don't know why we keep hitting on it. But, your Bible commands you. It's not an option. God didn't leave it open to interpretation. Okay? Real simple. Commandment is, be ye holy. The rationale behind it is, because I am holy. In other words, if you're one of mine, be like me. Not optional, not open to interpretation. Well, why would God command you to do something that was impossible for you to do? It's impossible for you to make yourself holy, but it's not impossible for you to be holy, to live holy as unto God, to walk in this unclean world as a holy vessel unto God. You know how you do that? You got to give over your silver, you got to get over your gold. In other words, you got to get over give over your heart unto God and say, "Lord, try me." Lord, I'm done using my scales and using my measurements and trying to figure out what I need to get rid of. Lord, put me through your fire. You can be holy, but God's got to do it. He will. Jesus said that whatever you commit unto him, he would keep it against that day. You know what that means? Anything you give unto him, he's going to keep it. What's against that day? Against the day of judgment. What did you give Him when you asked Him to save you? You gave Him yourself, your heart, your soul. Everything that you are, you're saying, Lord, here I am, take me. 
Right? But if you give God your heart, here's the thing about God. Whatever you give Him, He always improves it. Just the way God had shown me one thing in Jesus' earthly ministry that He touched that wasn't different after He touched it. If you give it to God and He touches it and gets a hold of it, it's going to be different. Why? Because He's a consuming fire. All He does is improve things. He refines things. He makes them purer. Well, what happens when you give yourself to God? Say, Lord, here's my heart. Try it. All those things that you're not happy with, get rid of them. Here's the thing. You don't even have to ask Him. That's just how it works. He is a consuming fire. When you say, Lord, here I am, what you're asking is, Lord, put me through the fire. Now, here's the thing about silver and gold. Silver don't get as hot in order to melt, but it's got to get hot more often. Sometimes you think, well, Lord, put me through the fire, and you think it's just going to be real hot one time. It may not be the case. God knows what's in your heart. God knows that the first time He heats you up, that's to get rid of the things that obviously don't belong there. But then He's got to heat you up another six times in order to get it to what? Where He can see Himself in the reflection. You know why the Word of God is like beholding yourself in a glass? Because God tried it seven times, and when He looked at it, He saw Himself. So when we look into the Word of God, what do we see? Him. And I know what I am. When I see His reflection, I know I don't match it. Why? It's like beholding myself in a glass, because it shows me what I am, and it shows me what He is. Don't you think it was an apt illustration that God chose to use silver as the analogy for His Word? Why? Because every page you just see Him. Right? But gold, on the other hand, gold's got to get a whole lot hotter. May only have to go through the fire, once, but once it goes through the fire, the only way to get gold to where it's not pure gold is you've got to heat it up and liquefy it again. Gold, you got those things in your heart that God considers gold. In order to get it to where only righteousness is left, because remember that's what the picture of gold was. He's got to get you so hot that anything that isn't righteous separates from it. But after that, you can't add something to gold unless you liquefy it again. You know how they make white gold, which is gold and silver mixed together? They got to liquefy both of them and mix it together. You don't just take a stick of silver and a stick of gold and whack them together and get white gold. That don't happen. You know how they shape gold? They have to get it hot again. You may be able to put a dent into it, but guess what? It's still gold. You may have a coin and you may be able to put a tooth mark in it, but guess what it is? It's still a coin. The only way to really change what gold is, you've got to get it hot again. Well, show me one thing in the world that's hotter than the judgment or the holiness of God. I ain't going to find it. You know what that means? He's got to get you really hot once. But as long as you don't put yourself back into the fire, try and change what you are, your righteousness, it's going to stay in the test. You know why people bit the gold to prove that it was gold? Well, what's the characteristic about gold? Well, it's got weight to it. It's heavy. But in addition to that, it's soft. That's why it's so precious. Because it's able to be marred. It's able to be scratched or dented. So in order to have something that's gold and not dented or not scratched, it means a lot of care has gone into taking care of it. But what's the world going to do to try and figure out that you're gold? Some of them are going to bite you. Some of them, they're going to take... Nowadays, if you go to like a pawn shop or if you watch the pawn TV shows, if they want to figure out if it's real gold, because nowadays they plate things in gold. It's, you can't separate them and you can't bite it because it's like on top of something else that's harder. So what do they do? They scratch it onto a surface to where some of the gold rubs off. And then they take some acid and they 
drop it on there and depending on how long it takes for that acid to eat through that gold depends on how pure it is but what's the world going to do they're going to scrape you up against some stuff they're going to try and wear it off and then they're going to test it and say hey you know what that was real gold and see I've got a heavenly father he says that he's the potter and I'm the clay they can rub as much as they want off of me but when I go back to him he's going to say here's a little bit more righteousness because see my righteousness you can wear it out we've already said it, it's filthy rags it's not worth even washing your hands with because your hands are going to be dirtier after using it than they were before All right, that's my righteousness but I'm not robed in my righteousness I'm robed in his righteousness you know what that means? They can scrape and scratch at it all they want. You know what they're going to find? It's real and it don't go away. And if he put me through the fining pot, maybe a longer process, maybe more unbearable. Because each time I go in there, I know something that used to be a part of me, I might have to let it go. Because you know when the silver was cooled down, once everything that could be separated was separated out. Heat don't get turned off until you let go of it. But when you do, it cools back down. That silver that he puts into you, the purpose of that is that when people look at you, they see him. You know why people today get the title of Christian, but people aren't walking around and saying, you're Christ-like? Because not enough people been to the finding pot. They don't have too much silver in their life. You know why some people don't want what we have? Because we don't have enough gold on display to show that you can taste and see that the Lord is good. You can throw whatever you want to at me. It's gold. Doesn't matter how angry you get, how hot you turn it up. It's gold. Right? So no wonder God said, or Solomon said, that God tries the heart of me because he's the only one that can. He's the only one that can take what he made and bring out his son, that new creature in us, the way that God intended it to be. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.